the guard called and said, hey, come fly F-35s. At that time, I was so sort of deep into electric aviation and we were acquired by Boeing and we had all this money and it was basically, you know, the leadership of Aurora said, hey, why don't you help us usher in this new era of, of air mobility? So it was like, you know, fly the F-35 or, or start, you know, electric aviation uh, with these amazing people I was working with. But then, you know, going forward to make this all happen from Regions' perspective, we've built this uh, incredible team in Rhode Island that is mixed between aviation and aerospace and maritime. And it's been really cool to see these two sort of previously separated worlds, engineering disciplines come together and sort of share the best of both worlds. Welcome to Tough Tech Today with Mayan and Miller. This is the premier show featuring trailblazers who are building technologies today to solve tomorrow's toughest challenges. Welcome to Tough Tech Today. Today is our second episode on our series of Blue Tech. Today we have Billy Tallheimer here. He is co-founder and CEO of Regent. He founded Regent in 2020 to create better solutions for transportation by electrifying coastal and regional transportation. Billy, welcome to Tough Tech today. Um, we're so happy to have you here. It's great to be here. Excited to talk about Tough Tech. Awesome. So as we kind of get into this episode, um, we've been really talking about the ocean as a resource and how Tough Tech can basically utilize this resource for technology yeah, for the betterment of mankind. Um, so one thing that you're trying to solve is transportation, which is very interesting. Regent has a electric aircraft, but there's something very special about it um, in that it's it's kind of amphibious. Can you just give our viewers a, a, a high level description of what this aircraft is? Yeah, so uh, Regent builds sea gliders, and sea gliders are actually a, a whole new mode of transportation. So they're they're not aircraft, they're not boats, they're they're sort of this thing in between. Uh, sea gliders, in general, as as a use case, uh, are for coastal mobility. So dock to dock, over water transportation. Uh, think about routes like Boston to New York, LA to San Francisco, island chains like Hawaii or Japan or New Zealand throughout the Indo Pacific. Uh, these are the sort of missions that sea gliders are used on. Um, sea gliders are a type of vehicle known as a wing in ground effect, W-I-G or WIG vehicle. Uh, and these are flying machines, basically flying boats that fly low over the surface uh, on a cushion of air, and that's called the ground effect. So it's the same sort of dynamic air cushion that you see birds flying on when they're flying over the surface. Uh, so sea gliders are similar, dock to dock, over water transportation when they fly they're always flying within a wingspan of the surface of the water in that cushion of air called ground effect. They do so with 100% battery electric propulsion. Uh, and so we're basically bringing a new mode of mobility to market that has the speed of an aircraft uh, with the cost and convenience of a ferry uh, with zero emissions. Yeah, so that's, that's really amazing. So you say it's a completely new mode of transportation. Did you invent this mode of transportation or is there something about this period in history that makes it a feasible technology? Well, it's sort of a, a dusting off of old wing and ground effect technology, plus you know new technologies that have recently matured that really unlock uh, the concept. So um, looking at, at wing and ground effect or WIGs, this concept has actually been around since sort of the, the dawn of aviation. And if you look at the 1960s, uh, there were efforts in, uh, in the Soviet Union with the Akronoplons in Germany, uh, with these lippage type uh, wig machines uh, so so people had sort of figured out like hey if you fly low you can fly like a bird you can get these range increases uh, but they never really caught on and they they didn't catch on primarily for three reasons uh, the first is uh, poor wave tolerance they're taking off and landing on their holes they're skipping off the surface of the waves uh, the second is poor maneuverability as they come mm -hmm. up to take off they're ripping low over the surface of the water at airplane speeds in these crowded water environments. Uh, and three is, is poor safety because they basically ask the, the pilots of these wigs, of these wing and ground craft, uh, to pilot them and essentially land the plane for the entire time you're flying the plane, right? Like hold them mm. just a few over the surface, uh, which is very demanding. Uh, myself, my co-founder, and a lot of the starting uh, founding team actually came from the electric aviation space. So we are working on 
electric aircraft working on EV toll, electric vertical takeoff and landing. And what we saw there was new technology and electric propulsion and in flight controls that would help some of these things. And then the other half of the founding team came from the maritime racing domain, came from America's Cup, which is basically the F1 of the racing world, advanced composite yachts that are hydrofoiling. Uh, so what we have in a sea glider is the world's first hydrofoiling wing and ground effect craft. And for those listeners uh, not familiar with hydrofoils, they're basically underwater wings. So uh, they provide lift being under the surface. They lift up the boat, or in our case, the sea glider on stilts, and then the, the waves are able to go underneath you. So those hydrofoils in harbors provide a high degree of wave tolerance, a high degree of maneuverability and comfort. And then we take off from those hydrofoils using our electric propulsion system stabilized with our digital flight control system in the open waters so that all our operators are doing and our operators are maritime captains and not uh, FAA aircraft pilots. So they're driving this thing just like a boat, left and right, fast mm -hmm. and slow. And they're doing so within a wingspan of the surface, but they're still operating in two dimensions. So you drive left and right and you just happen to be 20 to 30 feet over the water. Uh, and so basically what we've done is we've solved those complexities with and, and the reasons for the commercial inviability of the early wing and ground crafts, the maneuverability, mm -hmm. the wave safety. We've also solved some of the problems with electric aviation today, like the limited range, because now we have aerodynamic efficiencies of ground effect uh, and the certification and crew training pathway because we are a boat operated by mariners. So what we found is, you know, these sea gliders, now that we have this technology, are really a great solution across the board. Uh, and in the three years since founding, we've, we've built a backlog of about $9 billion worth of orders. So the market has certainly responded accordingly. How how has it been in terms of um, potential sort of what we call sort of dual use applications where there's certainly a commercial interest to get uh, maybe some, you know, goods and people um, from point A to point B, but also with with areas where there may be some uh, uh, defensive maritime operations, particularly I'm thinking parts of the the Asia Asia Pacific where there could be applications for this kind of uh, coastal you know fast maneuvering uh, craft. Yeah, well, while Region was founded with that sort of commercial focus, like, man, it is just painful to get from Boston to New York or L.A. to San Francisco uh, on those missions. We realized pretty early on there is a, a huge and actually existential capability gap uh, in this sort of littoral operations, which is the focus of geopolitics today. I mean, you look mm -hmm. even today in, in what's going on in the Red Sea. We're talking about maritime operations. You look at geopolitical tensions. Uh, with China and Taiwan and throughout Indo-Pacific, uh, really what is needed across the services is uh, more boats. <laughs> I mean, just put that simply, we need more boats. We need more ways of moving troops and supplies and establishing communication systems and getting uh, intelligence and surveillance platforms uh, out across the tyranny of distance uh, in the Pacific uh, and ensuring security of the waterways, both abroad and also domestically. Uh, and so sea gliders really fit right into that. So Regent's actually on contract with the Marine Corps right now to develop this technology. Mm -hmm. uh, specific, the, the specific mission that we're working on in the near term uh, is high-speed logistics and contested logistics. Mm -hmm. So we're supporting uh, Marine Corps Expeditionary Advanced Space Operations, or EABO. We're supporting that movement and disbursement of, of troops on island chains that might just be there for a day and might come in quick. So what you need to do that is a vessel that is uh, very fast. Uh, it's hard to see, so maybe it flies slow. Uh, it's very reliable, so it can operate whenever. So that means high wave tolerance. Uh, it's affordable because you need to buy thousands of them to spread them out over the uh, Pacific. It needs to have a high payload. It needs to be really easy to operate because, again, you need to captain these craft throughout the, the mm -hmm. Indo-Pacific. And a sea glider checks all those boxes. So we, we've seen the defense use case uh, as one of our fastest growing use case. We actually have a team out in Hawaii at the post conference right now uh, working on exactly that. So can you give our listeners just some context on the speed difference between this type of craft and a standard you know, boat that you might use in this sorts of situation? Absolutely. Well, a, a fast boat will go, say, 30 to 40 knots, right? That's a fast ferry. So it's about 40 to 50 miles an hour. You have at 15%. Uh, picker unit. 
Uh, I don't know if you have uh, listeners in Europe. We go kilometers an hour too. Uh, we do. <laughs> so that's sort of your, your fast boat, fast ferry. And obviously, depending on how big your boat is, right, waves are going to affect you or not. So if you're if you're in a fast ferry and you're going 35 or 40 knots, uh, you know you are you are getting thrown around in those waves. Uh, mm. The next fastest vessels beyond the the fast ferries. Uh, are probably hydrofoiling craft. So there are hydrofoil ferries today. They've existed for a while. Actually, Boeing made some back in the day too. Uh, they're operational in places like uh, China and Japan. Those will get you up to about 45 knots or so, so about 55 miles mm. an hour. The next fastest uh, marine craft would really be a hovercraft. Uh, and you look at sort of the mm. Marine Corps' use of uh, vehicles like the LCAC for these amphibious operations. That'll get you up to maybe 50 knots or so, uh, maybe a little higher. Obviously, these massive, you know, expensive, incredibly loud uh, things. And so we go from from that regime of sort of the, the very fastest boats on the water going 40 to 50 knots. So so call it about mid 50s miles an hour uh, to our vehicle, which will go 160 knots on the wing or about 180 miles an hour on the wing. Uh, but importantly, it's not it. You can't just go fast. You you also need to be able to go slow and be maneuverable in the harbors, in the littoral environments that make sense. And so mm. that's what's so uh, unique about a sea glider is we have three mm. modes of operation. We float, foil, and fly. So you can float for easy docking, uh, loading, unloading. You foil so you can be that sort of as slow as twenty, as fast as fifty knot hydrofoil ferry in the harbor but then you still have that 160 knot, 180 mile an hour top speed in the open water. If if we were on, on safari, I'd bring up some trivia of, is a, is a zebra black with white stripes or white with black right, stripes? Right. With, 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 with region craft is, is it a, is it classified as a, as a low flying plane or as a support, like a flying ship? How did you work through that? Yeah, well, uh, fortunately, there is uh, both at the international and national level already rules for this kind of vehicle. And, and mm. because we are not proliferated, you know, most people don't know these rules exist, but there, there are rules. So we just follow the rules. So uh, to the sort of zebra question, we are a boat that flies. We're a boat that flies in the ground effect. So we're under the jurisdiction nationally of the U.S. Coast Guard and internationally uh, of the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, because mm. there's actually a rule set co-developed by the IMO and ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, that puts wing and ground craft under the jurisdiction of the maritime body. Uh, hmm. And that makes sense because we're flying at 20 to 30 feet over the surface of the water. So our sea glider captains will be looking up at sailboat masts. They'll be looking up at cruise ships and cargo ships. They're very much in the maritime domain. They're only doing overwater ops. Uh, we're gonna be dealing with maritime right of way rules. And we're actually already in the international right of way rules. We have a light that we need to fly that's already in the rule. So if you're ever on the water and you see a blinky red light, that's a wing and ground craft. So all sea gliders will have <laughs> blinky red lights. Uh, and so your right of way, your navigation, your safety of lives at sea, your communication systems, all of these are in the maritime domain. You're navigating with, mm. with maritime charts, right? And so because none of that is aviation, that's why it makes sense that the, the Coast Guard and the maritime bodies uh, are the, the certification authorities for this vessel. Oh, fantastic. So one thing I want to you know dive down into, like this is a startup. You just started in 2020, and this is... This is tough tech, right? You're you're kind of creating yep. a new thing. It's got three different modes of operation. You have lots of automation involved. How did you how did you make the pitch to the first set of investors? Yeah, well, um, our first investors were actually Y Combinator. So we went through the the Y Combinator process. We were winter twenty one. Uh, and I would actually say to any aspiring founder, whether they're planning on applying to Y Combinator or not. Going through that Y Combinator questionnaire and having very, uh, you know, quick, uh, exact, intentional answers to each of those questions is, is kind of the best way to start a business because YC is a machine and they know how to create great startups. And it, it starts with having the clarity of, of thought and vision uh, of the company. So we started there and we applied and we basically said, look, we come from this aviation background. There have been billions of dollars that have gone into this because we're talking about transforming the way people move. We're talking about saving people the only 
truly limited resource on the planet, which is time. And so we're saving time and we're increasing the connectivity of the planet. That's why the electric aircraft and the EV tolls have had billions of dollars poured into them. We're leveraging electrification, which is being funded by the wave of EVs in general across modes, so including automotive. But there's this problem because we've been living in, the, in this space. It is not easy to electrify aviation. If you look back through history, it, costs a dec it, it takes a decade and it costs a billion dollars to certify a new aircraft. Uh, and with the technological limitations of existing battery technology, uh, if, if we're not going to get a Nobel Prize in battery chemistry anytime soon, we're talking, you know, max ranges of on the order of 50 miles for these vehicles. And we already have vehicles that will do 50 mile range pretty darn well. And they're electric and even going autonomous and they're called cars. So what we said is we can we can solve this regional mobility challenge. You know, growing up in the Boston area, we're, we're headquartered in Rhode Island today. So I'm thinking routes like Boston to New York or Providence to New York along that uh, East Coast corridor. Uh, as we've raised capital, I've become intimately familiar with the pain of LA to San Francisco, for example. And these routes exist all over the world. So we said, we can solve these routes, hundreds of mile routes. We can bring to it the, the sustainability aspects, but almost more importantly, the economic uh, advantages of an all electric propulsion system by solving the problems with electric aviation, by sort of dusting off the concept of the wing and ground vehicle and, and then you know solving those problems with new technology like I was talking about earlier. And, and they, uh, they responded. They <laughs> responded. Billy, that's, that's an awesome pitch. Very convincing. Uh, but I, I imagine a lot of the investors that are perusing YC companies, right, are your typical software investors. They want a, you know, relatively quick exit with a, you know, scalable kind of network effect business plan. And how did you, how did you address those things, both the time frame and, you know, the, just the different type of business that they're used to? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think to your point, you know, half to maybe three quarters of the investors were just immediately off our list. Like they, they wouldn't apply. They don't they don't understand hardware. They don't get tough tech. It, it like building with atoms is harder than building with bits. Like you can break stuff and it takes time to fix them. You can't just revert to your last code push. You know, they're they're expensive things. You have supply chain, you have lead time. Uh, so it's it's a fundamentally different business, which takes longer to incubate and grow. But then when you establish the technology, you have far more defensible moats. Uh, and so, you know, early on, it was really just finding those investors that that got tough tech or were previous operators and had already been through that process that could actually sort of help us and advise us on how to scale a manufacturing business or an aerospace business or a maritime business. Uh, you know, a business that is an OEM and, and delivering to operators and how we facilitate that sort of B2B play while simultaneously communicating and advertising the, the product to the end user who are, you know, the, the customers, the passengers who are going to be operating on these. Um, so that was sort of all how we handled this in the in the early days. What I think we're seeing now with, you know, shift towards climate investing, which needs to, which in many cases is hardware because you actually need to make a dent in emissions. Uh, with a shift towards defense and, and dual use investing with sort of the, the refocus on the U.S. industrial base. We actually need to build things again. It's hard, but that's OK. Uh, and also with the success, frankly, of companies like SpaceX and Tesla and Rivian and some of the rocket companies uh, that have you know taken off, no pun intended, re recently, it's like those moats are real. And when you build a business like SpaceX, that is a truly defensible business as opposed to you build the latest app and someone else builds another app and starts to steal your market share. So I think when we started, 25% mm -hmm. of the investors got it. Now we're starting to see, I think, a shift uh, in venture. And as Regent now gets into the growth rounds, right, uh, some of these equity investors on, on tough tech is becoming more in, uh, but they still need to understand it. And it is still more capital intensive and much longer cycle. Hey, it's j -Mill. I'm just going to pop in here to mention our episode sponsor, The End Effector, because the points Billy raises about the importance of tough tech, defense, and dual use investing are key parts of what we're working on over at The End Effector. Science Advantage startups face unique challenges that are different than those faced by SaaS companies or hair salons or someone who wants to make yet another dog walking app. The End Effector is gathering a community focused on hard tech, sharing insights into the unique challenges and opportunities faced by scientists, entrepreneurs, investors, and others who get tough tech. 
Sign up for a free account at endf.com. That's E-N-D-E-F-F dot com. No one builds alone. Now, back to our conversation with Billy. You have uh, you know, capital that has come in from across the U.S. and, and, and presumably across um, from elements around the world. Um, and yet the company is based in, in Rhode Island. Can, could you elaborate on what, um, what you are seeing in the, in the Rhode Island area that is making it possible for region to, to grow into this kind of international player? Yeah, well, it was it was obvious, you know, it was the, the Silicon Valley of the East, as they call it. So, you know, we are fighting our way into Rhode Island. Um, I, I say that a little tongue in cheek, obviously, you know, Rhode Island, not the not the obvious pick of where to put a startup, sort of a, a developing ecosystem. Um, we, we spent a long time actually thinking about where do we put the company? How do we maximize, you know, region's chance of success? We were founded in the in the Boston area. Actually, a lot of us came out of MIT, came out of a Boeing subsidiary that was based in Cambridge building uh, electric aircraft, but we were by no means tied to New England even. So we searched the whole country. We said, we need, uh, so, well, we had some geographical constraints. We're building flying boats, so we need good waterways. So we need wide open, protected, deep waterways uh, early on for testing. We need access to the ocean so that once we put these vehicles through their paces, we can send about on longer missions, subject them to real ocean wind and ocean wave. Uh, we need access to airports. We need access to talent. Uh, and we need a, a place to, to build right now. We need facilities sort of today as, as you know, that seedling company that was testing our, our quarter scale prototype, an 18 foot craft through now where Regents building our full scale human crude prototype, 65 foot wingspan to our, our future where we're building 100 passenger craft with 100 plus foot wingspans, we, we need the area to build and scale. And we actually found all of that in Rhode Island. We're right on the water. We're on this great um, this great industrial complex just north of Electric Boat uh, where they're building nuclear submarines. So we have the infrastructure around to scale massively. Uh, Rhode Island is does a lot of things well, but two of the main things are the blue economy and defense. And we do both of them. And so we've had great support both from the state and state leadership and even state investment, um, but also from local talent. Rhode Island is the, the capital of the sailing world in America. And so the very best composite boat builder, the naval architects were all critical to our design and build. Uh, many of them are based here. And then we're close enough still to, you know, Boston to get our, our flight software and, and control engineers and to sort of the, uh, the uh, aerospace giants like Sikorsky and Pratt and Whitney in Connecticut. Uh, so we're actually able to leverage sort of that latent talent of both aerospace and maritime in New England, plus the, the waterways centric nature of Rhode Island. And it's been a great decision for us so far. Fantastic. I, I would like to kind of learn a little bit about yourself, Billy. Like when, when you set out on your career, did you anticipate um, being a co-founder of a startup or was there a point in time where you had some realization that you want to take your career a new direction, create something new, and lead the charge in a brand new industry? Yeah, well, um, I kind of failed in that regard because I want to be an astronaut. Uh, I think <laughs> you know, me, and, me and all the other kids in my cloud, right, we want to be astronauts. So um, I, I kept that dream alive for a while. Uh, even going into school, I chose MIT because... Uh, they had the most astronauts outside of the, the military academy. So went there, I studied aerospace engineering, because so that's what astronauts study. Uh, and then I actually started to get involved with, um, with the Air National Guard, uh, because when I, was at, um, when I was working at Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, so I was doing you know, the commercial space efforts, I befriended the astronauts there and said, hey, how do you become an astronaut? I want to become an astronaut. And like the best way to become an astronaut is to be a fighter pilot first. And I said, well, I've seen Top Gun. That looks awesome. Uh, so then they said, you know, if you want to become a fighter pilot, the best way to become a fighter pilot is to join the National Guard, because rather than sort of have your your risk throughout the process, you, you join and you go through officer school, then you, you know, go to flight training, then you get fixed swing, then you get jet, then maybe you get your jet. Uh, in my case, and again, I was, I was grew up in Boston, was going to school at MIT. Burlington, Vermont, not too far away, was getting the F-35 as the very first base. So I said, I'm going to fly, you know, the most badass weapon system ever flown. So I applied to um, the Burlington Air Guard, uh, actually got selected for the job. Uh, and then around the same time, because I was doing a lot of hiking in the mountains, uh, as I would as I was visit 
Burlington, Vermont, uh, I got Lyme disease. And so I, I could not accept the offer. I went into industry. I remember uh, going to Aurora Flight Sciences, which is that Boeing subsidiary working on electric aircraft at the time, basically saying, I'm only here for six months. I want to design some airplanes because that's that was my education, but then I'm going to go fly F-35s. So and I said, that's fine. Come design some airplanes. Um, well, recovery from Lyme ended up taking about a year and a half uh, of, of, you know, antibiotic regimen and things like that. And by the time I, I got better, you know, the, the guard called and said, hey, come fly F-35s. At that time, I was so sort of deep into electric aviation and we were acquired by Boeing and we had all this money and it was basically, you know, the leadership of Aurora said, hey, why don't you help us usher in this new era of, of air mobility? So it was like, you know, fly the F-35 or, or start, you know, electric aviation uh, with these amazing people I was working with. Uh, absolutely the hardest decision of my life. Have have so much more respect uh, for, you know, the, the armed services of our nation. And while, while I obviously did not choose the service in that decision, I, I came to real terms with, with what that service means and how important it is and that it is true service, uh, even flying a fighter jet. And so I, I chose to stay in industry uh, I started leading some strategy studies there in terms of what the market looks like and how these electric aircraft work. Uh, and basically within six months of making this life-changing decision, convinced myself I had made the wrong choice uh, and that none of this would work. <laughs> and so that's sort of when I started poking around like, well, there's there's so much goodness here in electrification and the sustainability and the economics and the noise and the safety. And like, this makes sense and we're seeing it make sense in automotive. And the, you know, the reasons that we talked about earlier, why it's not making sense in aviation is the certification pathway and the range, which is just physics. And so, you know, how can we bring all that goodness? How can we bring the reason I was so excited to stay in industry and electrify transportation? How could I bring that to market in a different way? And so that's when my co-founder and I quit Boeing and sharpened our pencils and, you know, it increased the sort of engineering uh, acuity of this and start doing details like, hey, maybe this would work. Maybe a maybe a ground effect craft. And we started calling some customers, like, hey, let's try to let's try to raise some capital for this. And then we called in our friends and they're like, apply to Y Combinator, and uh, and you know we were off to the races from there. Oh, that's that's amazing, Billy. Um, you know, th with a, a company growing in this space, what who are the people? What are the organizations? Um, what are you looking for? Through, through the next stage. Yeah, so, um, you know, we've been really fortunate to to build up, you know, as I said, this this amazing order book, $9 billion on the commercial front. We have, uh, you know, awesome strategic investors like Japan Airlines and Hawaiian Airlines and Lockheed Martin. Uh, so we've been building this, this great cap table, you know, investors like 8090 Industries and Founders Fund and caffeinated capital in 0.72. So those partners have all been fantastic. I think as we enter this this next stage of Regent, uh, key partners across supply chains. So those in the electric propulsion space, those working on next generation sensor systems and flight computer systems, super important for us. I think uh, potential customers, of course, operators of this, whether they be airlines or ferry lines or even entrepreneurs were like, hey, this is an amazing capability and I want to create a company around it, which we've already seen. Uh, but then, you know, going forward to make this all happen from Regions perspective, I mean, it comes down to our team and it comes down to our people. And we've built this uh, incredible team in Rhode Island that is mixed between aviation and aerospace and maritime. And it's been really cool to see these two sort of previously separated worlds engineering disciplines come together and sort of share the best of both worlds. Uh, so, you know, to that end, like we are this year building our full scale human carrying prototype. We're going to put it on the water towards the end of the summer. And we expect to fly with humans on board by the end of the year in a 15,000 pound vehicle. It's going to be truly amazing. So we are hiring like crazy. We just raised our, our $60 million series A. Uh, so structural engineers, uh, flight control engineers, flight software engineers, electrification engineers, uh, aerodynamics, hydrodynamics. Uh, it's it's probably if it's related to air or sea, it's it's probably a listing on our website. So um, you know, just to that end, and to do sort of a selfish plug, definitely recommend people go to regentcraft.com and check out our our careers page, or even check out more on just like what a sea glider is because it is so different. But that that's really where we're going. It's it's supplier partners, customer partners, and then obviously uh, our team. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Forrest, you want to ask Billy to, to do the thing? 
thank you very much for coming on the show with us today. Um, yeah, at the end of every episode, we just ask that our guests uh, say their name and stay tough to kind of encourage our, our listeners to, to be tough and pursue tough tech and stick yeah. to it when times get tough. So can you <laughs> go ahead and say that? Well, I love that. It's it's real. I mean, tough tech is tough. You, you got to hang in there. So kudos to, to all the tough tech founders out there. I'm Billy Dahlheimer. Stay tough. Awesome. Thank you awesome. very much. Thank you. All right. Wow. It's, well, it's great seeing you. Shout out to Mary Emma, our newest pioneer subscriber. Thank you so much. Stay tough.